first of all, huge thanks for your time. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, your willing to do this interview uh, because so many events happened in the last month, almost a month after you did the historic climb to K2. When and why you decide to climb K2 without supplementary oxygen? I decided from day one, you know, um, and for me, you know, the biggest challenge of climbing without supplemental oxygen this time on K2 winter was, even though I wanted to do it before I went, one, I wasn't fully acclimatized. I had only slept at camp two. Normally you have to sleep at camp four uh, if you are climbing without oxygen. Second thing, when I was fixing the route uh, with my team up to camp three on the first acclimatization rotation, I had a frost nip on my three finger. So when you climb without oxygen, you become very cold. And then third was, I had planned to stand on the summit together with the team, singing the national anthem. That was my plan. I was leading the whole expedition. And the Sherpas are very, very, you know, fast climber. And then when they take oxygen, they, they are like superhuman. So I was very worried, like, you know, one, I'm not acclimatized uh, fully. Can I, can I still lead this team? Fortunately, I had the experience from last year of climbing all 14, 8,000 meter peak in just six months, six days. I was confident that I could still lead this expedition. All went uh, according to the plan. Uh, to be honest, some of my friends were like, wow, you know, because they were oxygen, they were trying to catch up with me. Uh, but I think it also gave them motivation as well. What was the most <sighs> critical moment during the ascent or descent from the summit? Do you have some critical moment there? Yeah, you know, when we left Camp 3 about 2 o'clock in the morning and it was a bit windy and as we climb up, you know, Camp 3, we reach, um, you know, Camp 4, the shoulder. It was so cold. It was very, very cold, uh, like next level. I was hitting my leg on the on the ice to warm up. I was just like, you know, and it was it was so miserable. Um, and at that point, obviously, my friends didn't tell me, but which, which they said later, you know, some of my team members were thinking of turning around. And that was the coolest moment. That was pretty tough. That was the critical moment for everybody to see, um, you know, and then not turning around and then keep pushing. But it was a very fine line. Some of the members of the expedition told me that you and Atanas Katov that you met at the base camp, you both with him were always smiling like generators of positivity. What are your personal impressions of Atanas as a person and <clears throat> as a climber? Look, you know, he is a great guy. He, we had you know, these amazing parties at the base camp when the weather was bad. You know, we used to dance, you know, and, and he's a great dancer as well. Honestly, I, I never thought that. And he's always you know, smiling and he's very humble. He's very humble, so down to earth. People who climb 11, 8,000 meter peak and, and of that level, normally, you know, there's a lot of, you know, ego. But he was very down to earth and he's, he's like my brother. Um, we also made the video before before I went for the summit push. Uh, sadly, man, he's, he's going to be super missed. Do you remember the last conversation that you had with him? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had summited and I got to base camp um, and he and his friend came to, uh, to visit me. Uh, they came with the camera, they recorded, and we were just talking. And um, I said to him, like, you know, good luck. That was the last conversation we, we had as a brothers to brothers. Because they hadn't gone for the summit push before that. I had summited and I was at the base camp, so they were asking you know, how it is and all. And I said, we have set the fixed lines to the summit, so it's, it's safe. Um, just be careful and, you know, keep plotting. Would you take a look on that picture? If you could turn back the time at that moment of the picture, what would you do in order to change the outcome of the following days? It's a very crazy, that picture. Two of my close friends are gone. It's very sad. And I also see another picture that I had taken with um, with one Pablo as well. Yeah, it's, it's a sobering reminder you know, how, how lethal extreme high altitude mountaineering is. To be really honest, we didn't know what it was coming. We were just like there at the base camp, you know, we all wanted to, you know, climb for our own purpose, own reason. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's very sad, you know. By the way, what was the condition of the ropes when you descend from K2 and what part of the route from Camp 2 to the summit was fixed with ropes? Was it everything fixed perfectly with ropes when you climbed it with your friends? Yeah. 
so when we climb so we 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 fixed um you know pretty much all of it on the summit push we fixed from camp two so we had fixed only up to on the first rotation just near to the camp so we finished all of the camp three and on the summit day we fixed everything to the summit and that's purely because i knew that we have to descend at night so and then for the safety if one there's one problem it's winter and then you got to help that guy and i could imagine that my whole team could be in problem so we planned to set whole of the of the route um because you know as i said we were planning to descend at night so we, yeah there was a fixed rope all the way to the summit there was a very unusual situation when sst expedition went to camp 3 on 4th of february uh, 25 people slept only in three tents and uh, two of those tents were for two people so uh, in this situation do you think that this is a huge factor for the upcoming tragedies on the next day uh, i really don't know obviously to be honest i i don't know how many people slept on on what tent because i wasn't there and and if i'm not there i don't want to comment that's me because i cannot give a justice to the ground level when i'm not there and i'm just speaking from here so that wouldn't be fair when you were in army you were always doing the briefs after missions in order to check what could be done better in your opinion uh, after mm -hmm. you know facts not directly but uh, i'm pretty sure you heard everything that happened there what could be done better i think you know like it's all it's all down to your planning you know we all went to the mountain and for example my tent were fully blown up at camp two. But then I went there to check by myself. If the tent is not there, it's an effort. But if you are not bothered to check that, then you have to carry the full equipment because it's mounted. You obviously need to have a contingency planning. You cannot just fully assume that, you know, what you have left on the mountain would be there. So this is a lesson for everybody, but it's not something new. You always need to have a backup plan. And then if you have been staying in the base camp for so long, Either you need to go and check, like what we did. We went to check our equipment and camp too. And that's when we know we didn't have it, so we came down and and we plan everything. But then, if you don't want to carry everything at one go, then you have then you have to go and check. If you don't want to go and check, then you have to carry because you know in mountain it's always bad weather. It's unpredictable, you know, and you can just like hope for the best. You can't do that, you know. You got to plan for the best. This is what it causes, you know, um, the lethal incident on the mountain because people don't plan to death you got to plan you know meticulously in detail because the, the mountain doesn't forgive you you know there's no margin for error in anything that you do on the mountains in 2019 we lost boyan petrov another bulgarian climber below shisha pangma it was the last summit that you conquered during your amazing challenge after petrov's death the china authorities closed the mountain how difficult was for you during those days of uncertainty? Will they will let you go and climb your last uh, peak from the challenge? Yeah, you know, for me, Sister Pangma was the last mountain, you know, and then the Chinese authorities are very powerful. I was very worried that they wouldn't probably give me the permission, but, you know, I think what I did last year wasn't my project. It was people's project, you know, it was for everybody. I wanted to show the world that nothing is impossible. And when people realize that, you know, your project is just bigger than yourself and it's for the better cause. That's what I think the Chinese government felt like. And there was a lot of support from all our friends from all over the world. They were writing to the Chinese authorities and, and the Nepalese government also, um, also wrote to the Chinese authorities. It was hard work because I was running everywhere to make this happen. Uh, but I'm just thankful that they allowed me to, to climb uh, Sisa Pangma with my team uh, in order to, you know, miss, you know, to, to complete the mission. Did you know personally Boyan Petrov? As I understand, uh, you were together with uh, Poli Gencheva, who was shooting a movie with him when he died. So personally, I didn't, I didn't knew him. Uh, I had, I hadn't met him, and that's purely because I came to this professional mountaineering world only from 2019. Before that, my job was different. I was, a, I was a member of you know UK Special Forces, so I wasn't a climber. So I didn't knew about him until, you know, I met Polly and then I started doing more research than, you know. You could get a lot of surprises in high mountains, as you mentioned, not only from weather or dropping uh, rocks, but uh, for example, in 2017 in Lotse, uh, your oxygen was stolen in Camp 4. Uh, how that happened and what went 
through your mind during that uh, moment when you are on the edge, you are close to the zone of death? You know, the biggest thing is in, in extreme high altitude mountaineering, you need to be able to recognize your weakness and your strength and you need to be, you should be true to your ability. Okay, that's a very key. You know, my oxygen was stolen, but then what would I do? I could be, I could get angry. I really look at this. You know, the brain is every time is struggling to get the brain, uh, to get the oxygen. And if you are not in control in peace, then you, you're going to be tired anyway. It's no good. So what I thought was, I just had to believe myself, which I, I told myself to believe that. Maybe it's right or wrong. I said, maybe my oxygen was used for rescuing people. So I thought positive and negative. And sometimes it's, it's all it takes uh, because you don't have the options. You need to make your own dream. You need to make your own bubble to believe in a better things for your better reason, better purpose. And that's what I did. Two, two of your life principles are everything you do in your life, you should never think about second option. And I would rather die than to be considered a coward. Isn't that a contradiction in climbing where you always should have a second option? Okay, there's two questions here, brother. Let's not get mixed up. It is better to die than to be coward. That comes from a Gurkha. I was a soldier. I was a British. I was a Gurkha in the British military for 16 years. As a Gurkha, that's how it is. When you go in the war, I'm not going to run away from the war. You know, that's where it comes from. As a mountaineering, it's a different perspective. As a mountaineering, there's a very fine line between being brave. Your very decision of being brave and, and wanting to keep climbing could make your mission successful. Equally, that very decision of being brave and not knowing your full potential and not being true to yourself can kill you. The line is very, very thin. Which was more dangerous and scary for you, running around landmines and dodging bullets during your time in the military or climbing the toughest mountains in minus 40 degrees while you are fighting for every breath that you could get? They both are different. In, in different perspective, to be honest, they both are equally dangerous, but I think this is who I am. I live my moment at a thousand meter peak. I live my moment when, when you literally have to make that decision between life and death. And sometimes you will fall. I have fallen in the mountains and when you're like, wow, you know, if I have been dead, then that's me dead. You know? But also for me, I'm most alive when, when I'm you know, in a thousand meters, you know, when I'm like gasping for that air, when I'm in that, you know, in my zone, you know, that's when I'm, I'm the happiest. How different is when you have companions with you, guys who hired you and your company to provide help during Alpine Accent? Uh, does the planning change a lot and how you manage to shape the mentality of the client, which is right next or behind you in the toughest part of climbing? I, I love guiding, you know, so the guiding mentality is completely different to the mentality of the crazy expedition that I was doing last year, 14, 8,000 meter peak in six months, six days, K2 winter. It's, it's a different mindset. But for me, guiding is, is like a passion. You know, I love to teach people. I love to pass my knowledge. I also believe that your knowledge will get bigger if you teach the people. And in, in high altitude mountaineering, it's, it's not one size fits all. Everybody's different. I truly believe that everybody can, can adapt to this environment because we're human, we can adapt. It's a time of you know, longer or shorter. And I love you know, exe executing these kind of you know, challenges. So I, I, I always have fun guiding, man. I, I love it. I would like to speak a bit about your book, Beyond Possible, which is pretty amazing with all your adventures. I think one of the moments, one of the most interesting stuff inside is uh, that you find your own, your own personal well of self-confidence in everything you are doing. Uh, do you remember when was that moment in your life when you first found that well and from then on you knew that everything is possible so i was a kid you know i, I was a kid i grew up in a in an extremely poor family in nepal my brother got into gurkhas in an in nepal Thirty thousand people like young guys had applied to join the gurkhas and only 230 could pass it in the british army it's a big competition and I used to stay in, 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 in the hostel um, and our teacher doesn't allow us to go out of the compound. Uh, but then I used to wake up at sometimes one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning and I run 20, 25 kilometers, sometimes 30. Then I come back at, at you know, I was only in year nine and I was, uh, I used to sleep uh, pretending that I haven't left the, you know, left, left the room. 
so that teacher doesn't find out and then my friends doesn't find out and then then I get beaten so i had that kind of a stuff from early age i think you know but it's all about looking back down i always had one ambition i i do that then i move on to other one you know i'm not everywhere it's scatter and then and what my ambitions my objective is is always something that i really love doing it or i really love or aspire to be that this is a perfect example you know first you got to love what you do in life then you work hard you work hard than you know more than every population in the world if you work harder than in you know, a 7.8 billion population then you can be number 1 or you know if you don't work hard and you just want to be you know you can't be number 1 in the world and i keep saying my success is, is is not a coincidence it's not accidental i have worked so hard for this you know people don't see blood sweat and tears behind this so to all the younger generation i say and, and whoever who, who sees me as a successful don't take this as a coincidence you know you got to work hard for it if you want to be number 1 as i said in the world you got to be working harder than rest of the population in the world but it's very tough to do so uh, okay in some mornings you are waking up very tired uh, what you say to yourself uh, to force to go up and to continue uh, achieving your goals what you say to yourself to your mind look yeah what you said is perfect you know maybe when you announce the project or something maybe you you do it because you know you tell the people and then if you don't do it they will make the joke out of you but when you are training every morning you say you got to go for a run every morning you you say to yourself you know okay tomorrow and you, know, you make a plan in the evening i'm going to go like 30 km run or 10 km run but then if you don't do it next morning just because no one going to find out or no one knows then that's a wrong attitude because you can lie the whole world but you will never be able to lie yourself and then to be that person you know as i said discipline is not enough you need to be self disciplined motivation is not enough you need to be self motivated if somebody have to wake you up at 5 o'clock and you still wake up and you run it's not good enough you should be able to do that by yourself you know this is the level that we are talking if you want to be that next level you know human next level in what you do you got to put next level of effort do you met some clients that are coming to your commercial expeditions got the desire to go to Everest or to some other 8k summit but uh, when the tough part is coming they just couldn't do what is necessary to to go up you know they are breaking too easy do, do you met such a clients and how you change their um, mentality personally i didn't had a really you know that kind of in you know, a clients and and it's the environment that you know we said at the base camp is the is the vibe you know it's just everything is is so important in this high altitude mountain why our team in k2 became successful Yes, we are we're good enough, but then there's a plan to detail in how you manage your team, how you put the positive in 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 the team, how you make everybody part of the team. It's the whole bigger picture. And if you can't nail that, you can't be successful. So when people come and and climb with us, you know, we we we, we try to create that environment, you know, that nothing is impossible. And um, obviously we push to their limitation um, and every risk is calculated. It's it's super calculated. So that's why you know I have led 21 8000 meter peak expedition so far and out of 21 all 21 is summit success not only summit success everybody has come home safely no one has even lost any finger so that's my track record but it comes with a huge planning it comes with with huge attention to to the detail okay uh, speaking of uh, planning what's next for Nim Spurja <clears throat> uh, you beat pretty much all the possible goals in climbing would you share with me and with uh, our audience what is your next big goal so when i finish you know the you know you know climbing 14 8000 meter peak in 6 months 6 days people ask me what's next i said stay tuned i'll surprise you and again stay tuned guys it will be a pleasant surprise but as i see from your expression you always have something in your mind right always always brother okay let's play a quick game i will guess something and you tell me from 1 to 10 how close i am to your next project one is very far away no. then it's bullseye okay <laughs> no yes. i'm not going to do that i'm not going to do that i'm not going to play this game brother it's going to be played in surprise that's all okay <laughs> and just a small hint would you tell us a small hint no 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 i think um i think i also got loads of responsibility as well brother you know you know i'm i'm a big advocate for you know climate change and global warming I need to work on that as well, you know. 
this is not the end of anonymous idea. You will see a lot more. That's all I'm going to say.